Sanbonani, Huya Nang, Jumela Mafrika Amantle, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and leadership, welcome. My name is Dineo Tsima from the SAS Tex Academy Technical. I'm also joined by our sign language interpreter, Ansi Wolfman. Ladies and gentlemen, our employers and fund administrators, it is a privilege to be here with you today. And we will be talking to you about tax directives. But before we get to the business of the day, let me take you through some of the things to note during the webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, feel free to post any questions that you have on our Q&A chat box. You can also use our email address, directivesquestions at sas.gov.za. But please take note that this mailbox will only be available until the webinar ends. After that, you may follow the normal channels. Like you can call our contact center on 0800007277. Or you can send an email if you're a tax practitioner to ppc at sas.gov.za or you can, or can use the one that says contact us at sas.gov.za. Remember, due to Poppy Act, please do not disclose any personal information when you are asking questions. We will try and answer as many questions as possible, either through the live Q&A chat box or by pan panelists later during the webinar. All questions that we won't be able to respond to due to time will be added to our frequently asked question document, which can be accessed via our SAS website under frequently asked questions. If you happen to experience any load shading, the webinar is live on YouTube and the recordings can also be found on our YouTube channel. The presentation will also be loaded on our website so that you can go back to it uh, if you want clarity on anything or you just want to refresh your mind. We also ask that you take a short survey at the end of the webinar, which helps us understand your needs in terms of information sharing and what topic you want us to focus on. Now, back to business of, back to uh, the business of the evening. Our program will be divided into three sections. The first uh, section is the presentation by the experts on the tax directive. It will be followed by the e-filing demonstration. And the last part will be the Q&A session by panel of experts uh, for the question posted on the email address. Just a quick uh, overview, ladies and gentlemen, of why are we here today? We are here today to come and share information about how to treat tax directives. The tax directive is an official instruction from SAS to a taxpayer's employer or fund manager to deduct a tax at a set rate determined by SAS. This directive ensures that a fair rate of tax is paid on your earnings, especially for larger or irregular payments. An approved, approved tax directive is only valid for the tax year or a period that it was applied for. As we always try and respond to our objectives, so our strategic objective, including providing taxpayer with clarity and certainty, as well as making it simple for you to meet your obligation. So during this webinar of the tax directive, we will share information on specific topics, which are, we'll look at the types of tax directives, types of tax directives by tax practitioners on behalf of individuals and employers, tax directive application process, timelines for the tax directive application, tax directive updates and changes, access to tax directive via the e-filing. Ladies and gentlemen, without further delays, let me call upon the first speaker. Our first speaker, is Lindy Kutsie. Lindy Kutsie has over 33 years of experience at SAS. She started her career in editing, later moved to assessment division, where she was responsible for individuals, business, and, tra and trust. Lindsay 
has served as a taxpayer education in a tax-based broadening and education division since 2002. Over to you, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you, Program Director, for that introduction. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I will be taking you through the presentation on the tax directors, and it will then be followed by my colleague, Ayanda, with the e-filing. So welcome again. The purpose of today, of this presentation, is merely to provide an information in an easily understandable format and is intended to make the provisions of the legislation more accessible. The disclaimer says that the information therefore has no legal binding or legal effect, and the relevant legislation must be consulted in the event of any doubt as to the meaning or application of any provision. Okay, so what is, what is our vision? So to build a modern source of unquestionable integrity admired by government, the public, as well as our international peers, so this is our focus for 2024, our purpose for 2024 or vision. And for the purpose of this presentation, we focus on the following strategic objectives. It's to make it easy to comply or simple, to create awareness, clarity and certainty. This is by just today by giving you some, some, um, some education or a presentation. Modernize systems to provide seamless online digital services, Use data for insights, risks, and improved outcomes, but ultimately to make it hard not to comply. In other words, for our taxpayers and businesses not to comply. So the points of service, we're going to be looking at the definitions and acronyms. We're going to look at the introduction, what is going to be an introduction. We're going to look at the types of tax directives, type of tax directives by practitioners on behalf of individuals and employers. Then the application process, what are the timelines for the applications, the tax directive updates and changes that have been made, and what ultimately can delay your tax directive application. Okay, so we're going to look at the acronyms first. So the fund administrator, what is the fund administrator? It means the fund or the fund administrator or manager, trustee or similar person with the primary administrative responsibilities for a fund according to the relevant fund documents. Reference to trustees and or a fund administrators include liquidators of retirement funds. Then the directive is what we're talking about today. A tax directive indicates an amount or a certain amount that must be withheld or a certain rate that must be used to calculate the tax that must be deducted and paid over to the South African Revenue Services. Then we're looking at two here, the ROT and the ROT01. So it's a recognition of transfer and the 01 is the form to be filled for the recognition of transfer between two funds before retirement must before retirement and must be used where a benefit was transferred to another approved fund. Okay, and then we're looking at the FSCA, which is your Financial Sector Conduct Authority. That is basically what it is. And then the annuity, amounts that are paid in a monthly, quarterly, or yearly installment. And then we've got the administrator of a trust or a fund. That is the person that is appointed to oversee or manage the affairs of the trust. Then we've got, again, a recognition of transfer, ROT02. And this recognition of purchase of a member or a beneficiary owned pension annuity form must be used to acknowledge the purchase of annuities from a registered long term insurer or if, in, or if transferred between registered long term insurers. And then lastly, I'm sure we all know this one is the retirement annuity fund, which we know as an RAF. All right, so why must a tax directive application be submitted? So fund administrations and, and employers are required in terms of the fourth schedule of our act to apply for a tax directive for lump sum payable or lump sum payable. SARS will calculate the prescribed amount of employee tax that has to be withheld from the specific lump sum payment, which must be paid over to SARS. This information, the employer or the administrator or fund administrator provided on application form or well, the information that they've supplied on the application form is used to determine the amount or the tax payable. 
So the fund administrators, trustees, long-term insurers, employers must submit a tax directive application, even if important, the lump sum amount payable is less than the allowable deduction in terms of our second schedule. Employers must also submit other tax directive application for lump sum payments, such as gratuities, fixed amounts, leave payment, and on retirement, and there's more, et cetera, than, I mean, ETC, et cetera. Right, reasons for employers, fund administrators to apply for a tax directive irrespective of the lump sum amount. So the lump sum benefits submitted by fund administrators, employers, or long-term insurers, the deductions that were previously allowed, or if the taxpayer will qualify for any deduction. So the applicants, which is your employer or your fund administrators are normally not aware of what I just said. Where a lump sum benefit is payable, a tax directive application must be submitted to allow SARS to, firstly, consider lump sums, if any, received prior to the current lump sum, calculate the allowable deduction in terms of the second schedule, determine the tax to be withheld from the lump sum benefit and issue a stop order where the recipient has any outstanding taxes. All right, now we're gonna look at the individual e-filing portfolio. So the following IRP3 employer application forms will be available. This is the IR3B and the IRP3C. So the B is employees tax to be deducted at a fixed percentage. For example, commissioned earners, a personal service company or trust. And then the IRP3C is the employees tax to be deducted at a fixed amount. For example, um, the fourth schedule hardship or assessed losses to be carried forward. All right, tax practitioners e-filing portfolio. The following IRP3 employer application forms will be available. As we stated earlier, the IR3B, which IRP3B, which is your employee's tax to be deducted at the fixed percentage, again, your commission agents, your personal service companies or trusts, your IRP3C, which is your employee's tax to be deducted when there is hardship and also assessed losses to be carried forward. Then we've got F and Q. So F would be your doubtful debts, so 11J12. And your Q is your foreign tax credit under paragraph 10 of the fourth schedule. Right, the organization e-filing portfolio. So the following applications will be available. So now you've got your form A and D, lump sums paid by pension, pension preservation fund, provident or provident preservation funds. That is, for example, death before retirement, your retirement due to ill health, your, um, your retirement or provident fund or your deemed retirement. Now, the reason retirement must be used where the member has reached the retirement age according to the rules of the fund and has either elected to take a portion or in case or purchase an annuity or annuities with the full benefits. A member can transfer the mem their member's interest into an RA, pension preservation or provident preservation fund before electing to retire. However, if the reason on the tax directive is retirement, the member cannot transfer the remaining two thirds of the to a retirement annuity, the member can purchase an annuity from a registered long term insurer, or can purchase an annuity from a registered long term insurer and have the annuity provided by the fund. Right, carrying on with the form or continued with the form A and D. Form A and D may only be used for certain lump sums paid by a pension, provident fund, including pension and provident preservation funds. This form cannot be used for a retirement annuity fund. So again, the Form A and D request reason codes. So on e-filing, a reason can be selected. So there you've got your description. Say, for example, one is death before retirement, two is retirement, three is retirement due to ill health, 
Four is a provident fund deemed retirement until the 28th of Feb 2023. And then the transfer of on retirement, which is paragraph 21C, and that would be code 52. All right. So on form, form B, um, that would be lump sums. Um, for example, resignation, withdrawal, winding up, transfer, section paragraph EA of the definition of gross income, transfer or payment, future surplus, unclaimed benefits, divorce, transfer, divorce, non-member spouse, divorce, member spouse, etc., etc. The form B directive request must always be submitted where a pension or provident fund is wound up. Note that form B may not be used for withdrawals from retirement annuity funds, but must be used if there is a transfer from an approved fund to a RAF. Okay, so form B may not be used for withdrawals from retirement annuity funds, must be used where if there is a transfer from an approved fund to a RA. All right, so here we've got on the form B, um, the form B directive request reasons. I'm just gonna go through a few with them. Um, here again on number five, the, the code, the, the description would be transfer. Number 22, the divorce member spouse. And then let's look at 29, where it says immigration withdrawal. And in brackets, it says e-filing submissions only due to documentation. So clearly we have to submit documentation together with that request. And then we've also got 44 where it says their withdrawal due to a visa expiry, again on e-filing submissions only, only due to documentation or on e-filing submission. And then on the last one, 57, again, I just want to point it out that it says cessation of your SA residence. And then again, because it can only be done on e-filing because it has to, or there must be some um, documentation to accompany that submission. All right. So your organization e-filing portfolio, you also get a form C. Um, the form C lump sums paid by a retirement annuity to a member, for example, death before retirement, retirement due to ill health, retirement, again, transfer from one RA to another, discontinuation of contributions, future surplus, divorce, etc. And then we've also got, lastly, the cessation of your South African residence. And then you get your form E, your lump sum paid after retirement by an insurer, for example, death of the member, former member after retirement, and then you get paragraph C, your living, living annuity commutation, and then death, next generation annuitant, next generation annuity commutation, and transfer of another of an annuity to another registered long-term insurer. That's a very big mouthful. Okay, your IRP3 employer form. So you also get now with where we did the A and we did the B and the C, now we're gonna get the S. The S is the share option. So your IRP3S, employer's tax to be deducted on an amount to be included under section eight or eight C of the act. Then you get your IRP3A, is your gratuities paid by employer, for example, again on death, retirement, retirement due to ill health, uh, retrenchment or other. Now, if you've got other, you need to supply a reason for payments. And then you get your IRP3B, which is your employee's tax to be deducted at a fixed percentage. Here again, we're looking at our commission agents, our personal service companies, as well as our personal service trusts. Um, there is a note that says, the IRP3B directive application process has been changed. So before applicants are no longer permitted to select a percentage of their own. So before you could do that, it was allowed. Now the process is you have to, it's completely automated and the system calculates the percentage based on the income and expenses declared by the applicant. In other words, you need to then give us projected income and projected expenses so the system will then do or calculate the percentage that will be allowed according to the information that has been shared. All right, the IRP3 employer form. 
Now you'll see the employer's tax to be deducted at a fixed amount. Again, we spoke about that earlier on, your hardship and your, less, your assessed loss carried forward. And now we've got F as well, which is your doubtful debt, which is section 11J12. And then we've even got a Q, which is your foreign tax credit under paragraph 10 of the fourth schedule of the Act. Right, so this is just what the form looks like. The applicant has been, um, or there, there, the part of the form is generic to all directive application forms, your A and D, your form B, your C, and your form E. So your reference number needs to be, to be indicated, your tax reference number, the year of assessment ended on, whatever year it may be, surname, the taxpayer's name, the initials of the taxpayer, the date of birth, which is then your century, your month and your day, your ID number, your passport or permit number if you're going under that. And then it also says if the taxpayer or member is not registered for income tax, select one of the following reasons. So if you click down, there will be a, on the drop down, it will probably give you the reasons. And then again, it says passport country of origin. So there you would go on the drop down box and select whichever country that would be, and then anything else you need to, they say specify other. All right, so that is basically how the form, they say this needs to, it's the generic and it needs to, or it's on the application form of the form A and D, B, C and form E. All right, now the recipient details. Under the taxpayer details container provide, sorry, under the taxpayer details container provide the personal details of the member or person who will receive the lump sum benefit. We saw that earlier on. If the tax directive application form is submitted and the directive reason is divorce or transfer or divorce, non-member spouse is selected on the directive application form with a date of divorce after the 13th of September 2007 and the date of accrual is after one March 2009, the personal details of the spouse who will receive the lump sum benefit must be completed under this container. The information in the container must be used to issue an IRP5 or the IT3A tax certificate for the lump sum benefit that has been paid. All right, Act of Income Tax Number. We all know this number is also referred to as the income tax reference number and is allocated by SARS to the taxpayer when registering for income tax purposes. This number must be on the IRP5 IT3A certificate. In the case of a divorce order granted after the 13th of September 2007 and a date of accrual after 1 March 2009, the income tax reference number of the spouse who will receive the benefit must be provided on the tax directive application form. SARS has implemented a new function on e-filing that allows the fund administrator or the insurer to request the income tax reference number where only the ID number is known. So if the taxpayer or member is not registered for income tax, select one of the following reasons. So it's either unemployed, or other, and then a reason has to be supplied, obviously, if you've now selected the other. All right, annual income. The annual income must reflect all income received by, or which accrue to a taxpayer during the year of assessment. We've got so many here, let's just do a few. Salary, remuneration, emolument, wages, bonuses, gratuities, commission, overtime payments, royalty stipends. Um, allowances and benefits, share of profits, rental income, and maybe honorarium. There's so much, all of that, and I suppose there could be more. This field is only man mandatory if the reason on the tax directive application is paragraphed EA transfer payment. This is only applicable to the public sector funds. The application is for unapproved funds, form B and Form E, where the date of accrual is prior to the 1st of March 2009, or Form A and D and Form C, where the date of accrual is prior to the 1st of October 2007. 
Okay, so how to obtain a tax directive. The tax directive application forms can be obtained through any of the following channels. E-filing, if not registered as an e-filer, please log on to the e-filing, sasefiling.co.za to register and refer to the guide how to register for e-filing and manage your user profile. Electronically would be via an interface agent or e-filing. So fund administrators or long in term insurers can be registered as interface agents or established interface agents to capture the tax directive applications online. The interface specification IBIR stroke 006 and the INF001 form to register to obtain access to the SARS interface are available on our SARS website. The following applications, no supporting documents are required. We have looked earlier on when there is support, supporting documents required. So it's your form A and D, your form B, your form C, your form E, your IRP3A and your IRP3S, and then part B of the recognition of transfer, which is 01, and the ROT, which is 02 recognition of transfer. Right. For certain tax directive reasons, supporting documents are required, for example, immigration withdrawal, cessation of the South African residence, withdrawal due to visa expiry, paragraph EA, living annuity commutation, termination of a trust, as well as cases where any tax directive reasons are used for a non-residence taxpayer, where the DTA, in other words, your double taxation agreement, must be taken into account. A certificate of residence must be proved, provided to confirm the residence status of that person or the person. So how to submit a tax directive application form? Note it is recommended that the fund administrator or the long-term insurer make use of either e-filing or the electronic submission of tax directive application forms through the interface agencies to obtain the tax directive. The fund administrators or insurance can only submit tax directive applications that require supporting documents through e-filing. For example, tax directives for non-residents that require certificate of residence or a visa expiry. So remember then the documentation would have to be uploaded. All right, so how long does this take? For applications with no supporting documents, the response is the same day, submitted during working hours. And then only applications with supporting documents where a case is created for a user to review, the supporting documents can take up to 21 working days. Right. Legislation, legislative changes to tax directives process have been implemented on the 25th of April, 2022. Taxpayers who are members of a pension preservation or provident preservation fund who have attained the retirement age and are 55 years and older are now allowed to transfer the retirement interest in that fund before electing to retire from that preservation or any or another preservation fund or a retirement annuity fund on a tax neutral basis using form A and D. The reason would be transfer before retirement. So that's paragraph 21C. Taxpayers can now on retirement elect to use two thirds or more of the total value of the retirement interest in the fund to receive a pension and or a annuity from the fund or purchase a living annuity and a, or a guaranteed annuity from a registered long-term insurer. Alternatively, they can elect to keep a portion of the retirement interest in the fund, which will then provide a pension or an annuity and use a portion to purchase a living annuity and or a guaranteed annuity from a registered long-term insurer. However, it is important to note that the condition placed on the purchase of an annuity, that the value of the annuity of each annuity living and or guaranteed and or remaining in the fund must be 165,000 and above respectively. So just look at that again. It says, however, it's important to note that 
the condition or the condition placed on the purchase of the annuity that the value of each annuity must be more than 165,000 and above respectively, or basically more than 165,000. Okay, the tax directive system included a validation that results in a tax directive applications for the, with, for the immigration withdrawal, reason where the date of accrual is on or after the 1st of March, 2022 being rejected. The tax director validation has been subsequently removed. This means that the accrued date for the tax directive applications with the reason immigration, sorry, immigration withdrawal can be a date after the 1st of March 2022, but the following supporting documents must be attached. The immigration application, which is your MP336B, with a date stamp before the 1st of March 2021, and a letter issued by the authorized dealer, or dealer must indicate that the immigration is recognized for purpose of exchange control before the 1st of March 2022, South African Reserve Bank approved date. The 19th of September 2022, the guide was updated to indicate that the information on the FSCA website must be used to complete the tax directive application forms to avoid the rejection of the application forms. This means the exact fund names must be used. Okay, it says the exact fund names must be used, including spelling, special characters, etc. So it must be 100% correct. So the 10th of October 2022 is the update on tax directive enhancements in line with the financial um, sector contact authority, which is your FSCA, we implemented. SARS implemented enhancements to tax directive process on the 16th of September 2022 by validating the name of the fund at the financial sector conduct authority, as well as the number with the FSCA database. Where funds and fund administrators experience spelling errors between information with the FSCA website that is not aligned with the FSCA registration, a letter, a request to correct the spelling error must be sent to the following contact person. Jodine Schultz, or Schultz, 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 at Jodine Schultz at fsca.co.za at the FSCA. Please note that the email address is only for the correction of spelling errors of names. Please take note, it's only for the correction of spelling errors of names. All other issues relating to the FSCA must be directly addressed with the FSCA via the existing channels available to the funds and the fund administrators. Fund administrators and registered long-term insurers are advised to continue using the name exactly as it is listed on the FSCA website until the, cha the, the changes on the name have been effected to avoid a rejection of the directive application. All right. The tax rates related to paragraph 2B of the fourth schedule are calculated using normal tax rates and information pertaining to the taxpayer at the time of processing. Given that such information may change and require a revised tax rate, an enhancement is, is required to cater for specific individual fixes and when necessary. In addition to providing an, an indication to the retirement fund or a long-term insurer whether the tax rates result from an initial full run, a rerun, a partial run, or a full year. All right. As per the current process, when the, once the tax rates have been calculated, the cover letter and the tax rate file are generated and made available to the employer on easy file. Easy file employer and e-filing for employers with 50 or less employees. Okay, so it says made available to the employer on easy file employer and e-filing in brackets for more or for employers with 50 or less employees. Enhancements to the user role roles on e-filing have been implemented to specify and 
provide clarity for various user profiles with respect to the following functionalities. To view, the user will be able to only view the letter containing the fixed rates related to paragraph 22B of the fourth schedule. Completion, the user will be able to view and download the file and complete application forms. Submission, the user will be able to view and download the file, complete and submit application forms. And then the IRP3S form has been improved to allow the, for employer share schemes that are longer than five years. The fields to indicate the qualifying periods during which the exemption under section 10102 may apply and other relevant fields were increased from five to 15 fields. Right, so um, what can, what the, the, the says here, the director sometimes needs to be a manual intervention. All tax or ID numbers, so this can cause the problem when the application or the, the directive application comes in. And then we have to, to, to um, obviously query that information from the fund or from the insurer. So the directive sometimes needs manual interventions from SARS. Why? Because there's old ID numbers. Sometimes it's that 001 or 002, but that is still old ID numbers which need to be changed. Taxpayers failing to update passport numbers. Fund administration administrators using incorrect tax numbers on the applications. Taxpayers having two active tax numbers with SARS, and then also a duplicated tax directive application. And yeah, so in that case, there will be a manual intervention. So remember our digital platforms. We have made it easy for you to go digital by downloading the SARS Mobi app via your app store. You can register on e-filing, SAS online query system. Um, you can book your appointment. You can also um, follow us on social media platforms, which include your LinkedIn, your Facebook, and Twitter. So thank you very much. This concludes my part of the program. I will now hand over to my colleague Ayanda for the e-filing presentation. Thank you, host. Please make sure that I can turn on my video. Okay, I will continue. Please be advised, host, that I, I cannot turn on my video. Thank you, Lindsay, for that wonderful presentation on uh, tax directives. I'm sure the taxpayers find it very beneficial because you, you are very detailed in how you went about with your presentation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ayanda Tagela. I am the support manager for SARS e-filing as well as EasyFile. I am joined by two of my consultants this evening. That is Noctula Mbata. She's a SARS support consultant for Gauteng and Free State, as well as Akona Tengwa, who's a SARS support consultant for Gauteng and Bumalanga. So they are available on the live chat as well as the question and answers to address any of your e-filing questions that you may have. So we do encourage you to use this platform to be able to engage us on e-filing. They are available to assist. Mine this evening is to discuss how you go about uh, submitting your tax directives through SARS e-filing, as well as important functionalities that will improve your user experience whenever you are having to do tax directives. So let's look at an overview of what I will discuss this evening. That is how to create a group on your SARS e-filing profile. How do you go about assigning taxpayers to the group? How do you assign users to that group that you have created? Activation of the tax directive functionality for an existing group on your profile. We will also look at the organization setup function, the merge request functionality, which is linked to that organization setup. And finally, how do you go about submitting your tax directives on SARS e-filing? Let's look at the steps of creating a group on e-filing. 
So just be advised that on e-filing, we give you an option to create groups. So this is particularly for portfolios that have got multiple taxpayers as well as multiple users. So you are able to create a customized group where you link taxpayers and you link users as well as the tax types that you want to be in that group. So let's just look into that process. You're going to log into your SARS filing profile. You're gonna select organizations on the top, then click on organizations on the left. Then you're gonna click on rights groups on the left as well. Then you're gonna click on manage groups. The group detail screen will then be displayed as you can see on my screen here. So you have selected organizations, manage groups, set up new group. So you want to create that group now. You have to make sure that you give the group a name. So you could say tax directives as the name of the group. And you also have to look at that authorization level that you're gonna to give to that group. We have three types of authorization levels. It's your view only completions and submissions. So with your view only option, this will allow you to only have view access for the tax file. And you've got your completions authorization level. You'll only be able to view and complete the forms or, or applications for the tax file. And then you've got the ultimate authorization level, which is your submissions. This will allow you to view, complete and submit the tax directive applications. Very important to note, you need to indicate if the group is going to have access to payments. So if you tick access to payments, this means that all the users that you have linked to this group will be able to make payments. So, so just be aware of that. Select the applicable text types to be activated. That will be the next step where you need to, you'll, you'll be able to view all the tax types that are available on e-filing. Make sure that you tick the directives option. If you wish to import taxpayers that are already part of that portfolio from an existing group, select yes. So where the system states that, do you want to import taxpayers from an existing group? This is where you'd go and select yes, and then click on add and a list of your taxpayers would appear and you will allocate the ones that you want to. If you don't want to allocate, you're simply gonna click on no, and then your group will then be successfully be created. As you can see on my screen now, the tax directives groups is there. You've got the open option. You've got manage payers as well as manage users in that group details section. So let's look at now you've created that group. How do you go about assigning taxpayers to that group that you have created. In the group details, you've got your tax directive groups. You're going to click on the manage payers hyperlink. Select the taxpayers that you wish to add to the new group and you're gonna click on save. So you'll here you'll see your taxpayers listed. You need to make sure that you select which taxpayers you want to be in that group. You will then receive a confirmation message stating that, are you sure you want to continue? Which of course you will say, okay. You will receive a successful message upon confirmation stating that your group has successfully been updated. Now you've created your group. You've linked taxpayers to that group. Now, how do you go about assigning certain users that are on your profile to that group? So once again, on that group details section, where you see your group that you've created, which is the tax directives, you're going to click on the manage users hyperlink. You're going to select the applicable user and drag this person into the gray box. So you're going to see your unallocated users here, my example on the left, where you will drag the certain groups, the certain users that you want to be in the group in this gray box here. Then you're gonna click on save and that will complete uh, the process to add the groups, to add the users, excuse me. And then we will ask you once again, are you sure you want to continue? You're gonna say okay or cancel. A confirmation message will be displayed after the user has been successfully added to the user group. If you do not prefer to use the drag option, 
we do give you a switch to grid view option. And this will list the users this will have a list of the use, of, of your users, then you can add them to the group. Where if you set if you select the switch to grid view, you'll be able to see the list of your users. Make sure that you tick in group for the users that you want to add to that group. Then you're going to tick the checkbox next to the user and click on save to link the users to the group. Now let's look at the activation of the tax directive functionality on an existing group. So now you went and created a group a while back on your e-filing profile and realized that tax directives was not added as a tax type to that group. You still have an option to rectify that. So you can still um, log into your e-filing profile and you're going to select organizations from the top main menu. Then you're going to click organizations again menu on the left. Then you're going to click on rights groups, then manage groups, then the group details screen will once again appear. Click on the open hyperlink on the group and um, ensure that the correct authorization level is selected as we stated before the three different authorization levels. Make sure that you select the tax directive tax type to be activated, then you're gonna click update. So you'll see the different text types that maybe are already selected, but text directives was not added when you originally created the group. You'll be able to tick on text directives and it will be successfully updated to your existing group. Once again, we will give you an option to import taxpayers um, that are already on your portfolio. If you want to add those taxpayers to a group, we still give you that option again. Let's look at the organization setup functionality on e-filing. So this is still found under rights groups. Um, you'll see the organization setup option there. And you select organization setup and the, or and the organization access rights overview page will be displayed with information of the representative organization details and organization access rights setup. Organization refers to the organization that is responsible for rendering the services. If you wish to change the default organization, select the applicable organization from your normal taxpayer list, and you're gonna select set as organization. If you select set as organization, this means that every time you log into e-filing into that portfolio, you'll always see this organization as a default. So make sure that it is their main company or main organization that you are setting as a default, setting it as the organization. You will also be able to see uh, the relevant user rights that have been updated. We see here this assigned user has got submission rights and tax directives has been updated as a tax type um, with other tax types on this particular profile. When you click on services on the main top menu on e-filing profile, the taxpayer will default to your default profile. This means that all tax directors will be stored under this taxpayer on the default profile. It is important to note, if the default profile is changed, the directive that was submitted on the previous default profile will not move to the new one as it remains on the original default profile. If you'd like to change the default setting, the following options must be selected on e-filing. Click on organizations on the top main menu. Then you're going to click on rights groups. And then you're going to click on organization setup. At the top of the screen, you're going to select the taxpayer that you want to be the default taxpayer every time you log into that portfolio on e-filing. Then you're going to click on set as organization, then that organization or that taxpayer, the company will be the main one every time you log in. Let's look into the merge request option. The merge request option is also part of the organization setup menu on your e-filing. This functionality allows you to merge profiles into one in order to better manage the organization's profile and information. 
This may be used when you have more than one matching profile against the same organization. You just need to make sure that you know what the username is for the profile that you want to merge your profile with. You're going to capture the login name of the user profile you want to merge. Then you're going to click on request merge button. We will, there will be a pop-up asking you, are you sure you want to send this merge request? You will then confirm okay or canceling the request. Once you have accepted the merge request, an email will be sent to the requested user. So that other login name that you requested the merge with, an email will be sent to them. And uh, you'll see also a pop-up on the screen stating that your request for a profile merge has been sent to the user, stating what their login name is. Email correspondence will be sent in this regard. Should your request be accepted, please ensure that the appropriate access rights and groups are duly assigned. The receiving user will be required to accept or reject your request. Once accepted or rejected, an email will be sent to yourself as the requesting party. If the request is uh, declined, the request will then be removed from your profile. The receiving user, that is yourself, as the requester will exit, I mean, uh, the receiving user that you've asked to merge your profile with will access the, the merge requests under organization rights groups, organization setup, where they will see the merge receipt details um, that will be displayed on the bottom of the screen. So you'll see the merge receipts. It will state who the requesting user is and their surname and their uh, registration number. And you've got the two options there to accept or decline the request. Once you select accept or decline, you will once again get those uh, pop-ups for your confirmation stating, are you sure you want to accept the request or are you sure you want to decline the request? If the request is accepted, you will receive the following message to confirm the merge. Your profile has been successfully merged with that of that other username that you requested and email correspondence will be sent in this regard. Now let's look into accessing the actual text directive function on your e-filing profile. You're going to click on services on the top main menu. Then you're going to click on text directives. The menu of the text directive options will then appear. So we've got five options when you select text directives. You've got an option asking um, request previous year's directives. So please note that on this option, you can only request the past three years tax directives. There's an option to request that will be when you want to submit a new request. There's pending requests, that's requests that have not been completed or not been finalized. They will be lying here. You've got your submitted um, tax directives and the history of all your tax directive transactions. So how do you submit a new tax directive on your e-filing profile? You're going to select services on the top main menu. Then you're gonna select tax directives on the left. Then you're going to select request to request that new tax directive. The following screen will be displayed with all the directive application forms, your IRP3 employer forms, recognition of transfer, your ROT forms, and the directive cancellation request. The following screen will display the tax directive applications of the different e-filing portfolios. So just to note, we need to remember that we've got three types of e-filing portfolios. You've got your organization portfolio, you've got your tax practitioner portfolio, and finally, you've got your individual portfolio. On an organization portfolio, this is the profile that actually has the most tax directive applications that you can do on an organization profile. And Lindsay did take that liberty to explain the different forms to us. So this is what you'd see on an organization profile. And for the tax directives available on a practitioner profile, which are limited, she did also explain that, is the forms that are di displayed on my screen now. 
The tax directives available on an individual profile are limited to only these two, which is your IRP3B as well as your IRP3C. You will then complete the tax directive according to the, the, the type of directive that you are completing. And then you have to click on the Submit to SARS button to submit the tax directive to us in real time. So that, ladies and gentlemen, brings to the end of my presentation. I now hand over back to you, Program Director. Thank you very much. Thank you. Apologies, ladies and gentlemen, for the video not showing there. Thank you, Lindsay and Ayanda, for such an informative presentation. Lindsay, you touched on different RP3s as well as forms that can be completed. And you indicated that there is a change that we can see on the IRP3B that an applicant can no longer select the percentage that they want to be taxed on, but they, the system will do so for them based on their projected income. You also caution us that the form B may not be used for the withdrawal of retirement annuity fund. Very helpful. The good thing, ladies and gentlemen, the presentation will be loaded on our website for your ease of reference. Ayanda, you took us through the e-filing. Great presentation. Um, we fund managers, tax practitioner, we can all agree that having access to e-filing is like having a branch office at your doorstep, only that it does not have waking hours. You see that you are able to set up groups give access of uh, different functions that you want your consultant. It's more like having a segregation of duties, or should I call it a segregation of functions? Isn't that great? I therefore encourage you to take advantage of this system and use it. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, to follow us on our social media, our Twitter page, LinkedIn page, as well as the uh, Facebook page. Remember also at this present moment, you can continue to send through your question via our Q&A chat box or sending an email to directivesquestions at sas.govn.za. That mailbox will be closed at the end of this webinar. Remember to always protect your personal information. Now, allow me to present to you our Q&A facilitator. Uh, Nobisa Bila began her career in SAS in 2006 as a contact center agent and is now an operations manager in the tax based broadening and education division. She has a Bachelor of Commerce honors in industrial and organizational psychology from the University of South Africa, as well as a Bachelor of Social Science in industrial and organizational psychology from the University of Cape Town. Nwabisa is deeply committed to taxpayer service and education. Over to you, Nwabisa. Thank you very much, Program Director. It is indeed a privilege to be part of the webinar that seeks to support our taxpayers. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. We would like to thank you for all the questions that we've received in our mailbox and our chat box. Your questions do assist us to test if we are providing enough clarity of your tax obligations as per our strategic objective one. Your questions also assist us to improve our processes as we are committed to giving you a taxpayer experience and making it easy for all our taxpayers and traders to comply with their tax obligations. Ladies and gentlemen, as the program director indicated, I am here to facilitate the Q&A session, but I am not here alone. I am accompanied by a panel of experts and please allow me the opportunity to present them to you. Our first panelist is Fulufelo Nematendani. Fulufelo is an ops specialist, policy and procedure for business design. Welcome Fulufelo. Our next panelist is Vaneshni Mupana. Vaneshni is a manager for interpretative tax policy. Welcome Vaneshni. As we saw earlier, giving us the e-filing presentation, 
we've got Ayanda Tagela, who is a support manager for SARS e-filing and EasyFile. Welcome, Ayanda. We also have Lindsay Kutsia, who's an educator at Tax Space Broadening and Education. Welcome, Lindsay. And last but definitely not least, we've got Darlene Peterson, who's a specialist for policy and procedure at Business Design. Welcome, Darlene. Thank you, ladies. Now we will start with our Q&A session. Our first question that we have reads as follows. The client, which is a company, is registered on my tax practitioner profile. I only get options IRP 3B, 3C, 3Q, 3F. What may be the cause for this? Please, can you assist us on this question, Lindsay? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, again. Yes, I will do that. Um, if you are a tax practitioner, you are limited to only applying for the IRP 3B, the C, the IRP 3Q, and the IRP 3 if only the organization portfolio has access to the IRP3A, not the tax or not the tax practitioner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Our next question is, I received the lump sum last year because I got retrenched due to the company being sold. So the company no longer exists. How do I get hold of the IRP5 for the tax directive? Lindsay, can you take this one again? Sure, thank you for that question. Um, paragraph 13.2 of the fourth schedule prescribes that the employer's tax certificate must be delivered to the employee within 60 days after the end of the tax year or alternative tax period, 14 days after an employee has left the employer's service, seven days after the employer has ceased to be an employer, or if further period as the commissioner under special circumstances may approve. Unfortunately, in this case, the employer must contact the company that bought the previous company to obtain the tax certificate. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Our next question is e-filing related. And this one I will direct to you, Ayanda. It reads as follows. Why do I get an error message when I'm trying to cancel a tax directive on e-filing? Thank you for that question. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, once again. We would need to find out what is the actual error message that they get on their e-filing profile when they're trying to access that tax directive. So we would need a screenshot of the actual error message emailed to us so that we can assist them. So I will share the email address for support for SARS e-filing. The email address is support at SARS e so we um, just ask them to please send us that screenshot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayanda. Our next question is directed to Vaneshni. It says, my tax directive application was rejected or declined. The reason was saying tax number is not valid for ID number on the application. Can you answer that one for us, Vaneshni? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Inwabisa. I can answer that question. The tax directive will be declined or rejected when the ID number is not updated on the SARS system. An example would be that the old ID numbers that end with 001 was used. The taxpayer must then make an appointment to update the ID number and reapply for a new tax directive. Or it could also be that the tax reference number was captured incorrectly on the tax directive application form. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vaneshni. My employer is taking too long with the tax directive for my provident fund payout. Can I apply by myself? Can you respond to that, Darlene? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Nabeswa. Yes, I can respond to that question. Unfortunately, only a fund administrator can submit a tax directive application for lump sum payments. The employer cannot submit it on behalf of the fund administrator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. Our next question is for you, Fulu Fellow. It says, my employer applied for a tax directive to SARS 
and half of my lump sum was deducted by SARS. When I asked my employer said there was a stop order on top of the rate for the lump sum. Employer said I must go to inquire at SARS. Can you explain this for us, Fulu Fellow? Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Nwabisa, for that um, question. Um, yes, that is correct. Uh, SARS will issue a stop order if there is an outstanding amount on a taxpayer account that is older than a month. If the employee requires more details regarding the stop order SARS has issued, the employee must contact SARS for more information. Thank, Thank you, Folo. Our next question, why do I have tax payable amount due to SARS, whereas my employer deducted tax as per the tax directive? Darlene, can you assist with the question? Yes, thank you, Nabiswa, for the question. There can be several reasons why a tax uh, is payable on assessment. SARS determine the tax when a tax directive application is received according to the information supplied. When a taxpayer submits his return or his or her return, SARS must use the date of accrual on each tax directive application to determine if the tax was calculated correctly on a tax directive system. And the taxpayer must please ensure uh, that there's no other factors on assessment that cause the additional tax uh, payable. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. When will a tax directive for immigration be rejected? Can you answer that one, Vaneshni? Thank you, Inwabisa. I can answer that question. A tax directive would be declined under the following reasons, where the supporting documents were not attached on e-filing on the form C or the form B tax directive application form, or if a copy of the MP336B is not provided and or the date stamp on the MP336B is after 1 March 2021. Or it could be as a result, the letter from the authorized dealers does not indicate the immigration is recognized for purposes of exchange control and or the date on the letter is after 1 March 2022. Also, the tax reference number um, could possibly not be active in the SARS system if the taxpayer is not registered or no tax reference number is on the SARS system because the taxpayer left the country before the year 2000 and the tax reference number was deactivated. The tax directive application form can be submitted without a tax reference number or the tax number must be reactivated. Thank you. Thank you, Vaneshni, for that detailed explanation. Our next question, when will be a tax directive for cessation of the SA resident be rejected? Darlene, can you answer this one for us? Thank you, Nabiswa. Yes, I can. Um, as Vaneshni has indicated, there can be several reasons for the rejection of a tax directive. Where the taxpayer has not informed SARS uh, that they have ceased to be a resident, uh, the REF01 uh, can be completed on e-filing or by making an appointment by a virtual agent through the e-booking on SARS website. Um, once the REF1 was completed and approved by SARS, the copy of this update tax resident status notice must be attached to the supporting documents. Um, and if that is not attached and only the declaration is attached, it will be rejected. The tax certificate uh, of residency obviously uh, must be attached uh, from the, and it must be from the tax authority of the new country. And um, if the certificate of residency is older than 12 months, it will also be rejected. And then the main thing is the supporting documents to indicate the member was not an SA resident for an uninterrupted period of three years or longer prior to the election to withdraw the benefit must be attached. Um, and then the other reason that can cause the rejection is that if there's a difference between the, the date of accrual, the period between the date of accrual and the date of sensation of SA, uh, applic uh, sensation of SA residency on the tax directive application is uh, less than three years, then it will also be rejected. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Darlene, for also that detailed explanation. Our next question is e-filing related. It reads, I get an error, a red error message. Taxpayer does not have rights to new tax directive when attempting to request a new directive. Or every time I click on the tax directive, I get an error message which reads, your access is denied because your tax directive profile could not be determined. Ayanda, can you take this one, please? Thank you for the question. Certainly, uh, there's two things that need to be looked at here. So firstly, it's the user rights, as well as checking if the tax directive has been added as a tax type on e-filing. So first, they need to check the user rights by selecting user on their e-filing profile, then change details, update user rights, and they need to ensure that the directives have been ticked. And then they also need to check if the text directive functionality has been added to the group uh, by selecting organizations, rights groups, manage groups, open, and then ensure that the text directive option is ticked. And I think I did demonstrate this in my presentation as well. Thank you. Yes, you did, Ayanda. Thank you very much. Our next question, we submitted the tax directive for the taxpayer about 13 times. The system gave us an error and the tax directive did not come back from SARS. We are not sure whether the tax directive application went through or not. Where do I check the rejection reason from my side? Fulufelo, can you answer this one? Thank you, Nabisa. Uh, yes, I can. Um, error messages indicate why a text directive cannot be processed. The error or the errors must be rectified and the text directive application must be resubmitted. SARS will issue a text directive if the application was successful with no errors on the application form. If the application was submitted through e-filing, the error will be reflected on the application at the top. Thank you. Thank you, Fulu. We have a question here from our commission, Enes, that says, can I still apply for my tax directive as a commission earner manually using the completed form? Lindsay, can you assist? Yes, thank you, I can. Unfortunately, a fixed percentage tax directive for commission income can only be submitted electronically through e-filing. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. I have been employed by a real estate agent and I am paid on commission. When is the right time to apply for my tax directive for a fixed percentage and how long is it valid for? Lindsay, can you answer this one as well? Sure, I can. The tax directive will only be valid from the month following the date of issue of the tax directive until the end of the applicable tax year for which the application was submitted. For example, an application form is completed and submitted on the 25th of March, 2023. The application is then processed. A tax directive is issued by SARS on the 26th of March, 2023. The directive then will be applicable for the period 1 April, 2023 to the end of February, 2024. And that is also what will be reflected on the issued tax directive. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Our question reads as follows, current IRP3S application where S101, where section 10102 is applicable, the system throws out an error if the source period is less than 12 months. Please advise reasons for this. As an example, one can have a period 1st July, 2021 to 30th June, 2022, and the next period from the 1st of July, 2022 to 31st January, 2023 in the source period. Yet you are unable to use these two dates as the error state one needs 365 days in a source period. It continues to say where a section 10102 application is applicable, there's also no indication from SARS on the directive issued what portion of the taxable amount is SA sourced and what portion is foreign sourced? In order for the employer to issue the IRP5 tax certificate accurately, 
in order for the employee to claim the foreign tax credit on the foreign source portion on assessment. As an example, if the total taxable amount is 122,000, currently the directive will indicate that this amount should be reflected under source code 3718. Instead of applying the apportionment between SA sourced and foreign sourced, and then to indicate that 80,000 to be reflected under source code 3718, and 40,000 to be reflected under source code 3768. Darlene, can you answer this question for us? Thank you, Nabisha, for the question. Let me try. The answer to the first part of the question is, um, it is correct. Currently, uh, the source period must be 365 or 360 days, or at least 12 months. The period cannot be less than 12 months where section 10102 is applicable. Um, can the person who submitted this question please provide SARS with the detailed information regarding the source period uh, that's less than 12 months and email the information to directive questions at sars.gov.za to enable SARS to review and evaluate the information and maybe enhance the system. The second part, let's try and see where the employer um, provide all the information on the um, tax directive application form uh, to allow the directive system to de determine exemption. So where 10 one, uh, section 10102 is applicable, this, all the details must be provided. Um, the employer must reflect then the total gain amount of 120 as uh, this, uh, as requested in ex example, next to code 3718 on this tax certificate, the tax directive information will pre-populate on the taxpayer's return um, and the final tax will be determined on assessment and will also take into account the tax credits the taxpayer claim on his her return. Thank you very much for that detailed information, Darlene. We have another question that reads from our chat box regarding the cessation of tax residence directive application. Why is it that there is inconsistency regarding the rejections? I've experienced the same directive application being rejected for various reasons. Incomplete application, documentation confirming cessation of residence not attached. However, we attach the supporting documents as confirmed in regulation, such as visa diaries. Can you assist, Darlene? Uh, thank you, Nabiso. Yes, let's try to see. As I previously indicated, there can be various reasons as to why the directive application is being rejected. The inconsistency is human beings that review the documents um, and some of them follow the, the process procedures, some of them do not follow it correctly. And that's the, that can cause the inconsistencies regarding the rejections. Um, the supporting documents, what I've picked up uh, with queries that I've seen is that the um, user that upload the supporting documents is not uploading, is thinking because I submitted previously, they do not have to upload it again. It must be uploaded every time you submit a tax directive. And very important, the three years uninterrupted period before you elect to withdraw your benefit must be uh, attached to the application so that you can make sure that this person is out of the country for three uninterrupted years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darlene. Our last question, I was just informed by a client that between May and August 2022, Applications on HC directives required the employer to declare the full gain and then the taxable portion of the gain for non-residents who are only taxable on SA source income. On receipt of the directive, taxable amount per SARS's directive was only the SA source portion and the tax to be paid over were only calculated on the SA source. However, instructions were to report gross full gain under 3718. Surely this is incorrect as the non-SA source portion, one is not reportable in SA and two should then at least be reported under a foreign non-taxable source code. Darlene? 
Thank you, Nabiswa. As I uh, previously indicated this, um, all the information must be completed on a directive application. And where section 10102 is applicable, obviously the system will calculate the uh, exam portion. Uh, yes, such will only indicate the tax on the taxable uh, SA portion. And therefore, as I explained previously, the information will pre-populate on the taxpayer's return, indicating clearly to us the tax, this SA taxable portion and the exemption that's not applicable. Therefore, the employer do not have to indicate the non-taxable portion under uh, three, seven, four, six, eight, sorry, so, yeah, three, three, seven, six, eight, because the information is on the tax directive. Thank you very Thank much, you. Darlene. Thank you very much, Darlene. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our Q&A session. We do hope that the information that was provided was enough to provide clarity to all your questions. And we thank you very much. And back to you, Program Director. Wow. Judging with the number of questions we received, it shows that this is a topic of your interest. Thank you, Nwabisa, for facilitating the session. Thank you, members of the panel, for your detailed responses. I'm sure it did provide clarity to our taxpayers. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, for all other questions that we could not get to on this platform, we will include them on our frequently asked documents and the documents will be placed on the SAS website for your ease of access. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending the webinar. Please note, you'll find the recordings of this webinar on our SAS TV on, your YouTube, on YouTube. Please continue to follow us on the tweet on our pages, uh, social media pages, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. There will be a survey which will be will, will pop up when you leave the webinar. We will appreciate if you could complete it for us, please. Ma Africa Amante, let me not keep you here longer than you expected to be. We have now come to the end of the webinar. We hope that it has been worth your while. Robert Diwan. Fellow South Africans, I'm addressing you this evening. All your years of paying tax, you helped us overcome our darkest hour. You, along with every other loyal taxpayer, helped build this nation. Thank you for every life you saved and for every risk you braved, for giving our future generation a healthy start. When you saw many of our vulnerable communities, you provided for them. When you saw our healthcare workers on the front lines battling COVID, you rose to the occasion and gave them the tools to save lives. Without your tax compliance, we wouldn't be able to fight a good fight. Thank you for contributing to the important services our vulnerable communities rely on every day. To all taxpayers and traders, continue to pay your tax because it matters to millions of South Africans who depend on it. Your tax matters.